Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Juan Maldacena. Dr. Maldacena is a theoretical physicist and the Carl B. P. Feinberg Professor in the School of Natural Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. He has made significant contributions to the foundations of string theory and quantum gravity, including his most famous discovery, which is the ADS CFT correspondence, a realization of an idea called the holographic principle that the description of a volume of space can be encoded on its surface. Dr. Maldacena is a MacArthur Fellow and among many honors is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maldacena to talk about black holes, Hawking radiation, and the structure of space-time. I'll be talking about black holes and the nature of space-time. Let let's first give a quick uh, outline of the talk. So black holes were objects that were found in general relativity by Carl Schwarzschild. They were very confusing. So Einstein thought, for example, that they didn't really exist or they were only mathematical curiosities of no physical significance. Um, and, but then it was understood that they were actually unavoid unavoidable consequences of the theory. Um, and then it was further discovered they were actually not black. So you could have uh, red black holes. Um, and that they imply that quantum mechanics is actually incompatible with gravity, or maybe that was a question that Hawking raised. Um, then we'll see that how through string theory, uh, black holes uh, as seen from the outside are compatible with quantum mechanics. And this will be based on a relationship between quantum mechanics and space-time geometry. But there are still several puzzles regarding the black hole interior. Okay, so now uh, let's start. Uh, that was a quick outline of what we're going to discuss. Um, so we'll start with the very basic thing, the principle of relativity uh, that uh, from several hundred years ago by Galileo, which tells us that uh, if you have two observers uh, traveling at constant velocity, they both observe the same laws of physics and they cannot detect their motion uh, without looking outside their labs. Um, so now um, then uh, we have the principle of special relativity. So that's Einstein. And the principle is basically the same thing. So the two observers traveling with constant velocity observe the same laws of physics. The only difference between the two is that there is one new law of physics, which is that there is a maximum velocity for signal propagation, the speed of light. Nothing can propagate at the speed bigger than the speed of light. And this should be the same speed for every observer. So that's the uh, interesting thing. Um, and it's interesting because naively from our everyday intuition, we would think that uh, if we have some light propagating and we see that light as, uh, well, the observer here that's sitting in stationary would naively see this light going faster than this one that is moving. By the principle of relativity, this is what our everyday intuition tells us. If your everyday intuition doesn't tell you that, then I'm not explaining this clearly enough. So this should be surprising. And it is surprising that um, this, um, this speed is the same for both observers and for the two observers to see the same speed, it is crucial that uh, the time for this moving observer flows more slowly than the time as measured by this observer. And also distances are different. So given that the times or distances are different for these two observers, the speed is actually ends up being the same. Um, so um, the principle of special relativity can only be true if time flows differently for these two observers. Now this gives rise to the famous uh, twin paradox. So let me explain what that is. So the idea is that we have two twins. They are born uh, exactly at the same time. And then uh, one of the twins embarks on a journey that uh, takes him uh, traveling at uh, very high speeds. And so his time goes more slowly um, and then returns back. And when he returns, uh, the idea is that uh, the one that was traveling at high speeds would be younger than the one who stayed stationary, okay? Now, of course, you would have to travel at really fast speeds for the effect to be as big as uh, is shown in this, uh, in this figure, um, but it's an effect that you can measure for elementary particles or 
or with you can see with very precise clocks. Now you might be confused that uh, the two uh, twins seem similar. One is uh, moving relative to the other, but the two twins are not completely equivalent because this twin on the right uh, felt some acceleration, and that's the one that was younger. Okay, so. Um, so the, the twin on the right was not traveling with constant velocity. Now, let's look at this twin paradox again, and let's uh, make up a new rule, OK? This is a, a new rule that says that the twins are born, and they go on this journey, and when they meet again, they die for some reason, OK? It's a somewhat macabre um, rule, but we'll, uh, we'll make this rule. Now, suppose these are the rules of the game. And uh, which of the two twins would you rather be? Would you rather be the twin that was moving, uh, or would you rather be uh, that was with change in velocity, that was feeling some acceleration, or the one that had constant velocity? So I let you think which one uh, you would rather be, and it's likely you would want to be this one on the right, on the left, um, because uh, that's the one who experienced a longer lifetime, um, and indeed. Uh, it turns out that elementary particles, the roots for elementary particles are such that they also prefer this. So when elementary particles move, they, in principle, could move along any trajectory, but they choose to move along the trajectory uh, where their lifetime is as long as possible. Um, so uh, this is the principle of maximal life or principle of maximal experience time, and that's uh, what determines the trajectories of particles. So that's how we describe the motion of particles in classical physics. And it's the reason that if you leave an object uh, stationary, it will stay there uh, and doesn't start accelerating uh, randomly. Um, now, the lessons of this discussion are that space and time form a single entity, space-time. The time we measure depends on how we move, and particles move in straight lines to maximize their lifetime. Now we go on to gravity. So um, Aristotle and our everyday intuition would say that heavier objects fall faster. But uh, Galileo realized that everything falls in the same way once we remove the effects of air resistance. Um, and uh, this uh, provoked Einstein to have what he called his happy thought, thought uh, which is that when you fall freely, gravity seems to disappear. Um, because uh, if you were standing on a scale, uh, the scale and you would fall exactly in the same way, and your weight would disappear. Um, this is uh, sometimes given a new fancy name, which uh, is called a new physics law of physics, which is called the equivalence principle. It basically says just that, that when you fall freely, gravity disappears. Um, and so that's the reason why the astronaut and the space station feel like they are floating relative to each other, though both are under the influence of gravity. I mean, they're all both moving around the Earth. Um, now, Einstein uh, took the principles of general relativity, the idea of space and time together, forming a single entity, and explained that gravity is due to the geometry of space-time. So the idea is that the heavy object curves the space-time around it. And a second particle, uh, so a, a light particle, a small mass, uh, follows the, the, the line that maximizes its lifetime uh, in that, uh, that space-time. Um, now, it's important that gravity changes the flow of time, uh, and that's uh, why particles move in a non-trivial, complicated way in a gravitational field. Um, so imagine, uh, just to illustrate this, imagine two people who are in a building. One is in the lower floor of the building, and the other one is in the top floor of the building. Uh, then if some time passes by, um, one person will see its clock going around for some time, and the one in the bottom will see the clock going at, going around for a smaller amount of time. So time will flow more slowly for the person that is in the bottom part of the building than the one that is in the top part of the building. Now, for an ordinary building here in the gravitational field of the Earth, it's not a very big effect. It's uh, one part in 10 to the 15. It's very small. But um, the best clocks that we have today can detect a, an, a height difference of about one centimeter. So. Um, so it's an effect that is measured, so it has been measured, and it's indeed the way uh, things work, the way gravity works and the way clocks work. Um, now, this leads to a second type of uh, twins paradox related to the first one, where we have two twins that are born, and then one uh, is uh, goes and stays near a very massive body, 
And then when they return, the one that was near a massive body um, will age less, similar to the person who was in the bottom part of the building. Um, now, Schwarzschild, after the Einstein found his equations for general relativity, Einstein found the space, uh, Schwarzschild, sorry, found the space-time geometry outside the massive spherical body. And this geometry tells us how time flows. So we are far away from the, the star, uh, time flows at a given rate. And as we get to the surface of the star, time flows a little more slowly. And this per person standing there would feel some weight. Okay? If we take exactly the same star and we make it a bit smaller, uh, then uh, time would flow a little more slowly at the surface of that star. So the, the star has the same mass. Uh, we're always keeping the same mass of the star, but making it smaller. And the person would see uh, feel uh, higher weight. Now, the surprising feature of this solution was that um, when you get to a critical size, it looks like the uh, time would stop completely and that the weight the person would feel there would be infinite. Okay? And this is what Einstein didn't like, and this is the reason that Einstein thought this was not a realistic solution. Okay? Uh, but that's what uh, the geometry tells us. Now, this, this person, these people who are stand, sitting here at a fixed radial position, at a fixed distance uh, from the star, uh, are, not, are not falling freely. What would happen if this person uh, that is here uh, decides to fall freely? Then, uh, if they fell freely, uh, it turns out that the geometry of the space-time actually continues be, be beyond that uh, surface. That surface is called the horizon, the surface where, naively, time seems to stop if you were to stay there. Um, but if you are falling in, uh, you just uh, fall in through that surface and end up, end up at the singularity. Now, the interior, we call the region behind the horizon the interior of the black hole. Uh, interior is not a terribly good word because it's really uh, more to the future of the horizon. So the, um, the region behind the horizon, uh, it looks like a collapsing universe. Uh, it looks like a universe that is experiencing a big crunch. Um, and that's uh, what happens. So the singularity is not at the place, but it's at the time. So it's uh, in the future of some observer who falls in. Uh, so it's a big crunch type singularity. Um, however, yeah, I should mention here that an observer who falls into this region of space time cannot escape back out. So you can go through the horizon and uh, you cannot come back out for the same reason that you cannot uh, travel to the past. Okay, so we should really think of the interior as meaning the future. Um, now, it's a, a useful analogy is one given by Unruh that the picture space time as a kind of river where the velocity of the, of the water in the river increases as it reaches a waterfall. On this river, we have some fish that can travel at some maximum velocity. Let's call it C. It's analogous to the speed of light. If we're in a region where the velocity of the water is less than the velocity the fish can swim, the fish can swim upstream and can avoid falling to the singularity. But um, there is a, if the fish is in the region where the velocity is bigger than the velocity of light, or the velocity, yeah, the velocity can swim, um, <clears throat> then the fish will fall at the singularity, will fall into the waterfall. Uh, if the fish is exactly, there will be a point where the two velocities are exactly equal, and then a, a fish here will be swimming, swimming, but it will stay always in the same location. But what is important is that uh, they do not feel anything special when they are going uh, through this region where it's the point of no return. Okay, so if a fish can encounters uh, f finds himself in this region, it will uh, fall into the singularity. Um, but if the let's say river is murky and the fish cannot see the the banks of the river, they don't notice anything special at this uh, particular position. Now, some lessons of this discussion are that once you cross the horizon, you cannot get out. Uh, a star can collapse into a black hole, and that there are objects in the sky that seem to be black holes. So let me briefly talk about those uh, real black holes. They are produced two types, produced by the collapse of massive stars of uh, these sizes, and also black holes at the center of galaxies, which are much bigger. So how do we see them? Um, so a matter falls in, it heats up, it emits light or other radiation, 
Or another method is to see the gravity waves produced when two of two black holes collide. So um, since 2016, we've been seeing black holes through their effects of gravity waves. Um, there are also black holes at the center of galaxies that produce uh, bright jets, and so they were conjectured to exist. Um, and more recently, we got the close, closer picture of uh, black holes at the center of galaxies. Um, and many galaxies similar to ours uh, have these black holes at this, their centers. In fact, uh, these are pictures for stars moving around the black, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. These are the orbits of the stars. And for this reason, uh, these observational astronomers got the Nobel Prize uh, last year. So a conclusion is that we are in a golden era for black hole observations. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Juan, for that uh, great introduction to, uh, to gravity and black holes. Cyrus, great. I will uh, let you ask, I'll, I'll allow you to talk and ask your question. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, so I was just curious from that twin paradox, yep. um, is bodily function like, like with time, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of a way to frame this, would time affect like the way, is that relative with respect to like how your body perceives time or is that or is... Yeah, so the idea is that if, if you are traveling, right, you are the traveling twin, uh, any clock that you carry, your biological clock, that is your body functions, everything, everything would slow down relative to the one that stays. So uh, it's really the uh, actual physical time, the true time that this person observes uh, will run more slowly relative to the other one. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned that this isn't even just a hypothetical. We've actually measured this. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this is actually measured. So if you take two identically built clocks and you move one of them relative to the other, you will see that the clock that is moving runs a little more slowly. In fact, there are clocks that are moving around, uh, forming the GPS satellite system. They are moving relative to the Earth, and this effect is important for understanding how they keep time. And we have a question here in the chat box um, from Mandela Mayrain. Uh, if elementary particles like to follow trajectories that maximize their lifetimes, then why are they attractive to massive objects? Well, because time flows, uh, yeah. So this is really, this was the situation when uh, we say that um, that the particle has to start at some location at some time and then at some other location at some other time. So the trajectory will, this particle will like to follow is one where it goes up and then down again. So it's the trajectory, let's say, for a projectile that goes up and down. So when it goes up, it's because it's trying to go and maximize the lifetime. It goes to the region where time uh, flows uh, more rapidly. So it's important in that, uh, in that to apply that principle to keep the initial and final positions fixed. Um, time's fixed. So, and James Lawrence asks, what did we learn from Mark and his twin? I forget his last name, one on the ISS and one on the Earth, right? So there were two twins, one astronaut went on the ISS, one goes on the Earth. Did we, were we able to measure any of these time differences? Um, no, the, the, these time differences in that case are, are very tiny for their biological age. But people measured other effects, like uh, the effects of not having gravity, for example. That's a bigger effect for us. And I think they talked about this, uh, about these effects. Right, so for, these other, for the, the effects you're talking about, we have to use very, very precise clocks. Like yeah, yeah, clock. very precise clocks or very, very high speeds. So the very high speeds for people are not practical. Right. Very high speeds for elementary particles are practical. And indeed, uh, you can accelerate particle, elementary particles that have a lifetime uh, which is, let's say, a microsecond if they are at rest. But uh, if you accelerate them, move them very fast, they can have much longer lifetimes. So I said it's a golden time for uh, black hole observations. However, this talk will be about theoretical aspects of black holes. So now we are going to see some interesting theoretical aspects of black holes, some things that bl make black holes very special. Um, so some interesting properties. So one of them uh, is a, their universality. So the final shape of a black hole is independent of how it's formed. It's only characterized by its mass, its angular rotation velocity, and its charge. Um, so you can have stars of very different kinds. So you can have 
starts with the different chemical compositions, uh, different, um, you know, um, they can have different shapes, they can have, they can have sunspots, etc. But if they collapse into a black hole, uh, the black hole is characterized by only these three previous parameters. And the charge is normally irrelevant in nature, in, in actual black holes. So it's just its mass and its rotation angular velocity. Now, this is just a side comment. So the ancients thought that heavenly bodies were perfect spheres, right? Um, and now we know that planets and stars are not per perfect spheres. But if you had a non-rotating black hole, it would it would supposed to be a perfect sphere classically, right? Um, and even if it is rotating, it's not the perfect sphere, but it's a, a shape that is completely determined by the equations. So you can it's analogous to perfect sphere. Um, so that was one interesting property. Another interesting property is the so-called area law. So um, it says that the area of the horizon always increases. So let me try to explain that. So imagine we have one of those black hole collisions that uh, the gravitational wave observatories uh, measured. So you have two black holes that form a bigger black hole. Now the mass of the uh, the mass of the total the total mass of the black hole actually decreases because um, some of the energy of the initial black holes, which was contained in their masses, gets emitted in terms of as gravitational waves. Um, uh, however, the areas of the two black holes always increases. So the final area should be bigger than the sum of the initial areas. So the, the final black hole cannot disappear, cannot be very tiny, has to have a size that is big enough so that the area is uh, bigger than the initial areas. And this is a, a relatively simple property that follows from complicated equations. And physicists always like simple properties that follow from complicated equations because uh, they are they give you a shortcut. They don't have to solve the complicated equations. You can check the simple property. Um, so, so far we've discussed the uh, black holes according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is a classical theory. When we include quantum mechanics, we find a new surprise. Uh, we find uh, white black holes. So black holes are not white. So th this is so surprising that even the name of the black hole was wrongly chosen. It's not quite white. Um, now, Hawking found that black holes emit thermal radiation, and the temperature of this radiation increases as the size decreases. So if you have a smaller black hole, it will look uh, redder, uh, then if it's sufficiently small, it will look white, and so on. Now, these are temperatures for black holes of various masses, so just to give an example. So if we had a black hole of the mass of the sun, which are the typical masses of black holes, astrophysical black holes, this effect would be very, very tiny. The temperature would be very, very small. So this is many, many, many zeros, uh, and then a three degrees Kelvin. So these are degrees above absolute zero. It is so small that it cannot really be measured in practice so for, for these big black holes. However, if you had a, a black hole that had the mass roughly of the mass of a continent, let's say of the North American continent, you put all that into a very a black hole, that black hole would have the size of a bacterium. And um, the size of a bacterium is comparable to the wavelength of light, and the, of white light. And so the radiation coming from that black hole would, um, would look white to our eyes. So if we were looking at such a, black, such a black hole, we would see a very, very tiny dot of white light. So the black hole would literally look white. Um, Now, people have asked, is there any experimental evidence for this so-called Hawking radiation? And the answer is no, there is no experimental evidence for the case of black holes. As we just said, black holes that are naturally produced in nature are very big. The, our black holes of the mass is roughly of the sun or bigger. And for those effects, for those, these effects are very tiny. However, there is a very similar effect in cosmology. When we have a fast expanding universe, there is also a temperature. And um, it's an effect that was discovered sort of soon after Hawking discovered this effect for black holes, and it's very closely related. It's also related to the existence of a horizon and so on. And in fact, this effect uh, is our best explanation via the theory of inflation for the origin of primordial fluctuations, which are observed in the cosmic microwave background. So a very close, so what I'm saying in this transparency is that a very closely related effect to the effect of Hawking radiation 
is actually something we are using to explain the structure of the universe at long distances. Um, OK, so let, let's just try to give a cartoon picture for why this effect exists. So, so far, I've only said that it does exist, but now let's see why. So it uses uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, and in relativistic quantum mechanics, particles can be created and destroyed. And in uh, this kind of theory, the vacuum itself is somewhat uh, complicated. There are uh, particles that can be created and destroyed in the vacuum. One way to understand this is the following, that there could be a pair of particles, one with uh, positive energy and one with negative energy that are created. Um, but for ordinary, the ordinary vacuum, only positive energy particles can exist. Um, however, the policemen in charge of ensuring that only positive energy particles exist are subject to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there's some principle in quantum mechanics, which says that you cannot really measure the energy over a time uh, that is very small. That means that the negative energy can exist for a very, very tiny little time. Uh, and then the policeman will not be able to forbid it from existing. Uh, but for very long times, uh, this type, this policeman, uh, policeman is just the loss of physics of uh, quantum mechanics in the vacuum, uh, do not allow them to exist. So that's the situation in flat space. So you can have the pair, but the pair has to immediately uh, annihilate. So on the other hand, uh, when you have a horizon and there is uh, something in the interior, there are again this. Again, you can have the process where the two particles get created, and there are these two policemen. Uh, but the policeman that is inside uh, perceives uh, the energy of this particle, which is negative from the point of view of the outside. It perceives this not as energy, but as momentum. So the, the, the flow of time is distorted so much that um, it perceives it not as energy, but as momentum. And the policeman doesn't have any problem with negative momentum. It's just a particle moving either in one direction or the other. And so. This policeman in the interior has no problem with this particle, and so it allows it to exist. And the one in the exterior is fine with the positive energy particle. And so the, this pair creation can then create a steady flow of particles that go to infinity. So here, this repeating uh, animation uh, represents different pairs of particles that are created. So we have a constant stream of uh, positive energy particles that escape to infinity. And that's uh, one way to understand the origin of Hawking radiation. Um, so there is some net particle creation. So what we see is that the life uh, of the black hole is the following. So as it emits radiation, it loses mass. So we expect that it will have a finite lifetime. And these are lifetimes of various black holes. So a black hole of the mass of the sun or the Earth will live much longer than the age of the universe. So because we, we saw that they emit very little uh, Hawking radiation. Um, a black hole of an ordinary mass, say 100 kilograms, that you collapse into a black hole, would evaporate in a tiny, very, very tiny fraction of a second and would be worse than a nuclear bomb, so converting all that energy into radiation. Um, a black hole of the mass of roughly mass of a mountain produced at the beginning of the Big Bang would be evaporating right now. Uh, and now, we don't know whether those were produced at the beginning of the Big Bang or not, but uh, people uh, look for them, and so far they have not been found. In addition, there could be very tiny little black holes producing particle accelerators that would decay very quickly. Again, none of these black holes uh, have been found. So they are predicted by some very special theories or in some special circumstances. And so far, they have not been found. Now, black holes uh, have some confusing aspects. So one is uh, this fact uh, about the temperature. And this leads to some confusion. So the temperature is, uh, or heat, is due to the microscopic motion of the constituents of matter. So the difference between hot gas and cold gas is that in hot gas, the molecules are moving faster. Okay. Now, um, this uh, heat is related to the notion of entropy. Entropy is a notion we use in physics that it's related to the number of microscopic configurations of the constituents. So in this case, would be the different positions where the molecules of the gas would be sitting in the, in the previous uh, animation. And the first law of thermodynamics gives us the entropy if we know the energy and the temperature. And from that, we can calculate, uh, since, we know the, sorry, since we know the energy and the temperature of a black hole, um, as uh, calculated by Hawking, then we can calculate the entropy. And we get a formula equal to the area 
of the black hole divided by L Planck uh, squared. So G Newton, and there are some factors of H bar and so on that works out to be a, a certain very small length. This is the length where quantum gravity effects become important. So for a macroscopic black hole, this is a very big, very, very big entropy. Uh, but one of the things this implies is that that area law of black holes that Hawking had derived by just solving, um, by just looking at properties of Einstein's equations, now uh, can be reinterpreted as a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, saying that entropy always increases. And so this is an interesting connection between classical gravitational dynamics and uh, the laws of thermodynamics, which look like uh, two very different uh, areas of physics. So this raises the question of what the microscopic constituents of the black hole are. So in the case of a gas, we had particles moving and we know what the constituents are, but what is uh, what are the same things for the case of black holes? Um, so are, are black holes classically perfect spheres as a classic uh, ordinary gas would seem to be uniform at macroscopic scales, but microscopically it's made out of little molecules. Is that true for black holes too? Is it true that uh, black holes are not quite perfect spheres, but there is some intrinsic motion. And what are the, the analog of these atoms for space-time? What are these basic constituents that are moving? Um, so th these results have inspired a certain hypothesis, um, which is that if we look at the black hole from the outside, the black hole is described by a system but can be replaced by a quantum system that has s degrees of freedom, where s is the entropy of the black hole. So it has s qubits. Qubits is the unit of quantum information, or the, the sort of basic dynamical unit in quantum mechanics. And not only that, but it evolves according to so-called unitary evolution, that is ordinary quantum mechanical evolution, as seen from the outside. So that if we do experiments on the black hole as seen from the outside, it will behave like an ordinary quantum system. So that's a hypothesis. And, um, but not everyone agreed with this hypothesis. In particular, Hawking said that it cannot possibly be true. Um, and his argument was uh, the so-called information loss argument. It's related to the idea that the black hole can form in very different ways. So you can send all kinds of information into a black hole. Uh, but when it evaporates, it always emits featureless, it appears to emit only featureless thermal radiation. Um, and so, um, if so, that was Hawking's argument. Now, if this is to be avoided, it, um, if the quantum mechanical description is correct, then there should be subtle differences in the outgoing radiation that carry the information of how the black hole was made. And uh, the question is how that information is imprinted in the radiation. So the the question is now uh, who is right? So is Hawking right, or the people who said that the black hole should uh, behave in a unitary fa fashion. Great. So you've introduced us to some real um, open questions, uh, the fascinating questions. Um, we have a backlog of, of questions from the first part, but I'll encourage people to type into the Q&A some questions from this, uh, this second part of the talk. Um, but let's go back and look at some of these, these right. uh, earlier questions. Um, Let's see, does the black hole at the center of our galaxy influence the solar system? Like, does it uh, influence the orbit of Pluto? Um, no, I don't. Well, the black hole has a million solar masses, um, and the mass of the galaxy is a rough, roughly a million times bigger. So it's a small influence on the, the motion of the sun. I mean, it does influence, but very, very tiny. So one millionth of the, uh, of the influence. Right. But, but it's not responsible for Pluto having a, a different orbit or... Oh, no, no, not at all. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, trying to get to the questions that are connected to this last part, but let's see. Uh, an, an anonymous attendee asks, says that you mentioned that the singularity was some point in the future. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Well, um, that means that... Um, Space-time, as, as you are in the interior, space-time looks fine, looks fine around you, but in the future, it collapses. At, at some time in the future, it will collapse. Or if you are living there, you live happily for a while, and then, and then you start getting more and more unhappy, you get stretched and compressed by gravitational forces, and you die at the singularity. That's what it means. Great. 
Um, so, so I'm going to answer one question as a lead into another because uh, Bernice Kleinman asks if, uh, if a woman traveler were pregnant, would the would would she have a longer pregnancy? And, and the answer is she'd have as long a pregnancy as she would have for herself, not a nine month pregnancy. Okay. Um, it, but it, could a particle move uh, fast enough so that it doesn't experience time at all? Um, well. Yeah, in the in the limit that you go at the speed of light, then you don't experience time at all. And so, let's say a, a photon or a massless particle, uh, you could say that it does not experience time at all. Great. Ah, let's see. So, um, Mandela asks, does the policeman who lives inside the black hole see the evolution as as unitary? And you have to tell us what unitary means. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, that policeman sees the evolution of the quantum fields living inside the black hole as unitary. Um, but uh, the degrees of freedom we were talking about when we talked about the unitarity of black hole evolution are the degrees of freedom uh, that describe the unitary evolution for someone who sits outside and can do arbitrarily complicated experiments. Um, um, we, we don't know how to completely uh, join that description from the, uh, the, as seen from the outside with uh, a description of someone who lives, like the interior policeman who lives in the interior. So that's uh, more like um, the boundary of current research to make, to, to have a compatibility between the view of black holes as seen from the outside with the view uh, of black holes seen from the inside. And these are like these are long-standing problems for the last 40, 40 odd years, forty-five years. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's been progress in some 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 of the questions, uh, but not in this particular one. Well, I mean, some progress in this particular one, but not 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 enough. I mean, a complete understanding so, of the interior would um, would also tell us what happens to the singularity and how to resolve the singularity. What what's the proper description? And we don't have. And we're not there yet. Yeah. So, so Fred Litt reminds us that, um, that, that, that there were people even before G general relativity who, who knew that a massive body could have an escape velocity faster than the speed of yeah. light. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I guess we, 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 that we didn't call it the black hole, but we didn't call it a black hole until much later, right? Till, till the 1960s or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, right. that's right. Yeah, yeah, it could have been called a black hole back then, I guess. Uh. <laughs> so. Gary Klein asks, how does light escape a black hole like at the center of M87? I mean, how do we take pictures of black holes? Next week, Dimitros right. Saltis is going to come and show us a picture of a black hole. And you showed us, you showed us a preview. Yeah, I showed the, the famous picture of a black hole. Well, the, that, that's not light coming from the interior of the black hole, that no light can, from, can come from the interior. This is light that comes from the matter around it. And so what you're seeing is uh, the light from matter that is around the black hole that's been distorted by the gravitational field of the black hole in a characteristic way. That, that's really what you're saying. So the black so we hole. haven't measured, as you said, we haven't measured any of this light that sort of comes from the interior, not even from the interior, from the right. very surface. Oh, yeah, you, you, mean, you mean the Hawking radiation. Yeah, that, that comes from very close to the horizon. But yeah, that for M87 would be completely negligible. So that's impossible to see, yeah. OK, so in, in order to, re to answer this question or to, to address this question of what happens with the black hole as seen from the outside, we need a theory that puts together quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and uh, a theory that does this is the so-called string theory. Now, I will not tell you everything about string theory. I will just uh, only say that it is a theory under construction, so we will not completely understand it. Um, but it's a theory of quantum gravity. So it's a theory of the quantum mechanics of space-time. Um, and it reduces to Einstein's theory under ordinary circumstances, so long low long distances or low energies. Um, and it can describe and it can describe in a complete way certain simple universes with negative curvature. And I, I will center I will center my discussion on this particular point. But there are many other things about string theory you could say that I'm not saying right now. So um, this is what we are going to discuss. Um, so this is the idea of holography, that we can describe the interior of certain space times in terms of a theory on their boundary. So these are particularly particular negatively curved uh, space times. Um, 
This is a picture by Escher of the hyperbolic plane. So this is a space with constant negative curvature. So here you should think of this fish as all having the same size. But um, when you project that negatively curved space to the plane, to the flat surface of the screen, the fish were deformed just to fit them on the screen. So that's the same as what happens when you have a sphere. Um, you have uh, the world map, for example, and you project it on a flat surface. Then uh, countries like, I mean, regions like Antarctica get blown up to be very big and, and so on. Um, here, the opposite happens. The fish, these fish appear very small near the so-called boundary. So this boundary is really infinitely far away from the point of the interior. There are infinite number of fish as you approach it. Um, so it's a region very far away. And the idea is that the physics inside this region, gravitational physics inside this region, can be described in terms of a theory of particles at the boundary of strongly interacting particles. This is a, another cartoon picture of the same thing. So we can have some object in the interior. And the object in the interior has an alternative description in terms of uh, particles that are strongly interacting. So this funny motion of the particles try to, tries to represent the fact that the particles are strongly interacting. Um, now you can ask uh, how you see a black hole. So if uh, we have the description of, uh, so here we had the description of the particles. So we now ask uh, what about a black hole? So for a, for a black hole, uh, we could consider a black hole inside this, uh, this negative recurve space. And then the description would be in terms of a fluid or a large number of particles that sits uh, on, their, on the boundary. Here, it should really be a very continuous and it should be really full of particles. I just, for, I just got tired of making these uh, moving particles. Um, and uh, the temperature and entropy of the black hole are related to the temperature and entropy of the motion of these particles. So when we're asking before <clears throat> what the microscopic constituents of the black hole are, so one picture for the microscopic consti constituents are these particles that move uh, on the boundary. So it's a weird description, but it's the description that seems to be pretty good. Um, so the one interesting fact is the theorem on the boundary obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. And therefore, then uh, the black hole in the interior should also obey the same rules of quantum mechanics. And so black holes are consistent with quantum mechanics as long as you accept the fine print here. So the fine print is that if you accept that holographic conjecture that we mentioned before that the, but the description of gravity in the interior is completely equivalent to this theory of particles at the boundary. And as I said, there is a lot of evidence for this conjecture, but it has not been proven. Uh, but it's uh, widely believed to be true by people working on these subjects. But well, someone could disprove it. Um, now, in this, in this discussion, there is a kind of immersion geometry in the sense that there is a quantum system that lives on the boundary of hyperbolic space. This is another picture of hyperbolic space. Um, but the gravitational system has one more dimension. So how can it be that the system that fundamentally lives uh, in a space, let's say, for example, here on, the, on, on this line, uh, can give rise to an extra dimension? Okay. To, to try to explain this, um, how we think this happens, I will resort to an analogy. So it will be a, a verbal analogy. So we are going to start with a sentence. So the sentence is, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different grammar. So this is just some random sentence. So here we wrote the same sentence again. And now we're going to analyze this sentence. We're going to first find the words in each sentence. So here we identified all these words. And in your mind, you did this process of analyzing these words. The words uh, then get organized into uh, different uh, verbal phrases and noun phrases and so on. And you can continue the analysis into the first phrase and the second part of the phrase and so on. And not only that, but um, there are also uh, correlations between words. So for example, man, his, and he are correlated. Uh, also the notion of keeping pace uh, is correlated with uh, drummer, the word drummer, okay? So there are these long distance correlations. Um, and as we analyze the sentence, we find deeper and deeper meaning. And we can think of this analysis that examines, examines the meaning of the sentence as uh, an extra dimension. So here, when we draw it this way of grouping words and so on, it looks like we are grouping them in an extra dimension representing the extra dimension representing the correlations that exist between the different words. 
Um, okay, so the, the idea is uh, going back to, uh, to this holography idea, so that we have some quantum system on the boundary uh, that is a very complicated system. It's a bit like a very long sentence. And all these figures here are representing the analysis of this uh, sentence. So there are correlations at short distances and then, uh, and then longer and longer correlations uh, and so on. So it's like the semantic or syntactic grammatical analysis of the sentence. And these other long distance correlations between some words in the sentence could be viewed as particles that propagate in that uh, space time um, between those different points. Um, now you can ask, what is a black hole in space time? So then for that, we, we go back to the sentence again, a very nice, uh, nicely formed sentence. And we start uh, changing some words, okay? So for example, here, we change a few words. So instead of his, uh, I put its, and then him, she, and then different uh, lecture. So now we lost uh, some of the long distance correlations that we had between the different words, okay? And the sentence makes sense up to a certain level, but not beyond that, okay? We can further change more words in the sentence. And if we set, change more words um, randomly, then the sentence makes less sense. It has a less deep meaning, okay? So it makes meaning up to certain depth, but not more. We can say that that means that the black hole, our ignorance is growing, okay? And finally, if we just change all the, all the letters randomly, the, the, this, this makes no sense at all. And uh, our ignorance is uh, very basically complete. The black hole has grown as big as uh, you possibly can have grown, could have grown. Now, so the area is roughly the, the ignorance and uh, the area growth is the fact that the area grows uh, can be understood as the fact that if you change a sentence, a well-formed sentence, if you edit it randomly and you change some words randomly, these random edits are most likely to mess up a sentence, right? So we are most likely to mess up the sentence and the sentence will make less sense. Um, now, suppose that uh, the changes uh, that we got here were produced by a reversible process, like an encryption algorithm, uh, where each letter is changed by some other letter, but in, in a very deterministic way. In that case, the, um, we could reverse the process and recover the original sentence, okay? So if you only are given this and you don't know the algorithm, then this doesn't make sense. But if you know the algorithm, then you can reverse the process and recover the original sentence. Now, the laws of physics on the boundary uh, change the state in the boundary theory, okay? It's like a change of that sentence we were talking about. And it is analogous to an encryption process in the sense that it's reversible. So the laws of quantum mechanics are uh, reversible. And so in principle, we can do the, we can undo the formation of a black hole and in principle recover the original information. Okay, so this is what would be involved in recovering the original information. So I mentioned that the quantum mechanical property of entanglement plays an important role in constructing the space-time geometry. And I will discuss one example. So that's the example of the two-sided Schwarzschild solution. This is the original solution that Schwarzschild found, the solution of the vacuum Einstein equations. And it was later understood by these various people that it really describes two black holes that are connected. So these are basically um, two black holes. So the, the spatial, so at the moment in time, it's a time dependent geometry. So in, at the moment in time, um, there are two uh, asymptotically three dimensional, so two th space times which go to flat space far away. And when you go in, uh, they have some narrow neck, uh, a two sphere here and they co it connects it to a second separate uh, three-dimensional space-time. And it's a solution of Einstein's equation. So it's a weird uh, object, okay? Um, now, those two um, black holes, those, that solution which co co connected two separate space-times can have a relative, which is a very similar solution where the two black holes are in the same space-time, but they are connected through the interior, okay? They share a single interior. So these are two black holes sharing a single interior. Um, now, if you find two black holes in nature produced by gravitational collapse, they will not be described by this geometry. Each will have its own interior. But you can still ask, uh, what about this particular solution? What is the interpretation of this solution? Um, this type of uh, solution can be viewed as a wormhole. It's a kind of uh, something that connects to faraway regions. 
but it connects them in a way that they are not traversable. It's a wormhole that collapses. So it's it connects the two points at some instant in time, and then it collapses into the singularity. And the presence of the singularity implies that you cannot travel from one side to the other. You, you try to travel, and the wormhole stretches and closes before you can exit on the other side. Um, so now the idea is that we, we, we mentioned the, the, con the idea that in the exact theory, each black hole is described by a set of microstates from the, the outside. So it's described by a quantum system uh, that has various different states um, that the number of states gives the entropy of the black holes. And the idea is that the wormhole is an entangled state. So entangled state, entanglement is a form of correlation in quantum mechanics that says that if you have microstate number one on one black hole, you also have microstate number one in the other black hole and so on. So they are all uh, correlated with each other. And so we see that there is a geometric connection that emerges from entanglement. Um, so going back to this verbal analogy, so something analogous to this, would be a situation where we have a sentence. So this is the same sentence we had before. And in the bottom, we have the same sentence in Spanish in a different language, OK? So when we analyze this sentence, the, uh, the letters are different, uh, the level of the letters, the, the words uh, might be different. But at some point, uh, the two sentences mean the same thing. So we get to a layer of meaning where both are, are identical, OK? And uh, so in some sense, they are connected through that common meaning that they have. Um, so that's uh, similar to these connections in space-time. And let me finish uh, this with some story of uh, what it means for the two black holes to, um, to share a single interior. So imagine that um, there are two people, let's call them uh, Romeo and Juliet, and uh, they fell in love with each other, but their families don't like each other. They don't like them to meet. And so they, they separate them. They put them one in one galaxy, the other in a different galaxy, very far away, or different region of the same galaxy. But they are very smart, and they, they, they build a quantum computer, and they produce two black holes that are perfectly entangled, and so on. And after that, they jump into their respective black holes. Right. So their families that see them jump into the black hole uh, think that they committed suicide. Okay, because they jumped into black holes. And that's what the narrator of the story actually wrote. However, uh, because they constructed two perfectly entangled black holes, um, what happens is that these two black holes are sharing an interior. So this is a kind of picture. I didn't explain it carefully, but this is a picture of the space-time diagram of the connect these black holes that are sharing an interior. So the right side is the region outside one black hole. The left side is the region outside the other black hole. And this is the common interior. So the interior can be accessed by entering through this horizon or by entering through this horizon. And so uh, the space-time diagram uh, looks like this. So when they fall in, they actually meet in the interior, and they can exist for a while. And in this version of the story, unfortunately, they die at the singularity. There is a way of having an alternative story where they don't die, but I don't have enough time to tell it to you. So uh, in conclusions, um, we see that black holes are fascinating objects where the geometry of space-time is deformed in a dramatic way. Um, black holes and quantum mechanics give rise to interesting theoretical challenges. And string theory can describe black holes in a consistent way, at least as seen from the outside. Um, and space-time uh, can be viewed as an effective or approximate concept, which arises from more elementary particles living on the boundary of space-time. Um, and then, uh, correlations, or more precisely, the quantum property of entanglement, I didn't define it clearly, but it's a type of correlation, um, plays a crucial role in determining the structure of space-time. And this fact we discussed basically through that analogy, where uh, the structure of the sentence and the meaning of the sentence is encoded in the correlations uh, between the different words. Um, OK, thank you. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.